Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to wrap up the proof that uh, the LP relaxation of the R arborescence problem uh, is integral. Uh, and this gives us an opportunity to, uh, to use this characterization, total dual integrality and the hoffman kruskal uh, theorem, which we've given in previous lectures. So let me briefly summarize the previous lecture to see where, where we are. Um, so recall that the, uh, the min length R arborescence LP is given as follows. The, the, the critical thing is we've got a vector which we assume to be integral of uh, non-negative lengths. And uh, I guess I should give the, the, the basic definition is that we've got our uh, directed graph. And um, so this is, this is directed. Sometimes I call the edges arcs, uh, but I'll use it interchangeably. And we have uh, the lengths on uh, every single arc. And um, we define a matrix C that has exponentially many rows. So uh, C is a matrix whose columns correspond to arcs or edges. And the rows, exponentially many of them, correspond to R cuts. In other words, any subset of V excluding the special node R, which is called the root node, and, is, and, and defines the R arborescence problem. Uh, so again, just a, a brief note, this has exponentially many rows. And our LP is minimize L transpose X subject to CX greater than or equal to one. And X non-negative, and therefore the uh, its dual is maximizing one transpose y subject to y transpose c less than or equal to l, and y also has to be uh, non-negative. So where we started is by choosing any max. So we want to we want to show total dual integrality, which means again that we want to show that for any integral l. Uh, the dual has to have an integral solution, not just integral value. Now, um, note also that we assume without loss of generality that L is non-negative. Now, for total dual integrality, we actually need to show the dual is integral for any value of L for which the dual is, uh, has a finite value and is feasible. But if L, it's easy to see just by looking at the primal, if L has any strictly negative values, then because there's nothing stopping us from choosing an arbitrarily val large value of x. Uh, the primal becomes unbounded. The dual becomes um, infeasible. So without loss of generality, L is non-negative. And what we did last time in the previous lectures, we took y, a solution of the max problem, um, that also maximizes this quadratic objective. And why did we do that? Uh, so that also maximizes. And as I emphasized in the previous lecture, this is not a by, uh, that does not have uh, two criteria. It does not have two, uh, two optimization criteria. First, we, we look at all the maximizers of the right-hand side, and then we choose one that also maximizes this. Um, and, and um, Basically, what I left as an exercise in the previous lecture, I'll copy here again, and it's to show that this set F, which is essentially the support set of uh, Y, so in other words, all subsets U of V minus R, 
uh, such that y is strictly positive is laminar. And as a quick summary, an example of a laminar set is something like this. So a set is laminar if any two subsets that belong to uh, that set of subsets, um, either they're nested or they have no intersection. And this is an example of, of laminar. And then what we did is we took C, this is an exercise, not example. So it, we took C dash to be the submatrix of C corresponding to just the elements in this laminar family. And we saw again in the previous lecture that by removing those rows, what happens? We have fewer constraints in the primal. If you have fewer constraints, uh, that means that the min is, is going to go down. Uh, that means that the, therefore the max is going to go down when you have fewer of these uh, fewer rows. Rows in C uh, correspond to constraints in the primal, but they give us power in the, in the dual, essentially variables in the dual. So if you remove variables, you can only make your life worse. But we saw that in this case, removing these particular rows that correspond to the non-support, the off-support of Y, does not, make, does not impact the dual. So in other words, we saw that the um, max that had the same value as maximizing over uh, C dash less than L transpose. And what's the advantage of this? The advantage is, first of all, it has the same value. But secondly, we saw that it's very easy to extend an optimal solution from the right, in other words, the, optimi the maximization with C dash, to a, uh, an optimal solution on the left. And the reason that this is important is, that we're, is what we're going to show next. Uh, it's in the title of the slide, but I'll just write it as a lemma here. The matrix C dash is totally unimodular. This is essentially where we left off in the previous lecture because we observed that as soon as we have total unimodularity for C dash, then we know that we have an integral problem for this reduced maximization. But if that has the same value, and in fact, can, we can extend any solution to uh, the C dash maximization to the full uh, maximization problem, then we know that the dual is integral and that satisfies the condition for, to for total dual integrality and that's basically our story. So now let's focus on showing the total unimodularity of this matrix um, C dash. And, and this is where laminarity is going gonna, is gonna to feature um, critically. So what do we need to do? We need to use one of our characterizations of total unimodularity that is convenient here. And we're not going to use the original definition that shows that any subset uh, has any square submatrix of C dash has a determinant that's plus one, minus one, or zero. We're going to use something that uh, we, we stated without proof is, is equivalent in, uh, in the lecture on total uh, unimodularity. And namely, um, we're going to show that for any subset of the rows of C dash, we can partition that subset into two so that the sum of rows in one subset minus the sum of rows in another subset is a vector that uh, is comprised of just plus one, minus one, and zeros. So here's, so we need to start with some subset of, uh, of this, uh, of, C, of, of the rows. So let's uh, choose any subset. Let's choose a subset of rows of C dash and let's and this subset the rows of C dash now correspond to the elements of script F. So I'm going to use script G to uh, to denote this subset of the rows. And now I'm going to make an important definition and this is where laminarity comes in. For each element 
of G. So U is a subset. Define the height of U by H of U, which is the height, is the number of sets T that belong to G. So this is height with respect to the subset G that we've chosen with T a superset of U. Remember what laminarity looks like. So you can just visualize what height means by stacking, by imagine that you're actually cutting these out of paper and creating this picture by, by stacking. So uh, in, in this case, there are no sets T in G that contain U, if that's U. And for this set, there is one set that contains U. And for this one, there is two. Okay, so this illustrates uh, height. Now, this is what's going to allow me to partition the sets, the, 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 the set of rows into, uh, into two subsets. And I'm going to do it according to the parity of the height. So note that, uh, so, so, so let me define G even and similarly G odd to be all U in G such that its height is even. And similarly for odd, u in g, such that h of u is odd. And so obviously uh, g is equal to uh, g even union g odd. Okay, so now we want to show that this is the right partition. All right, so let's see, let's see what this, uh, so, so again, what, what have I done here? This is C dash. So all of the rows correspond to elements of F. We've chosen some subset of these rows, and that's called G, not G dash, just G. And now we're further dividing them into odd and even. So, you know, maybe some of this will be odd, odd, even. It's not an index thing doesn't go odd, odd, even, even. You, you should just try it out for yourself. Write out some sets, you know, perhaps write out what the matrix, what the rows of C would be for, uh, for something like this. And, and then label and see which, which ones would be odd or even. And with each one of these circles representing a different subset U. Um, Okay, so so this is how we're gonna define uh, we're gonna define g odd and g even, uh, and and then the important claim is the following. For any arc or edge. For any edge. E, remember this is directed. We have a directed graph of G. Not script G, my my graph G. The number of sets in G odd entered by my edge E. So again, what, what does that mean? Remember that we're talking about uh, the subsets uh, are subsets of nodes. Okay, so when I'm drawing this picture here, of my laminar sets, these are subsets of nodes. And therefore, a particular edge originates at a node and ends at, uh, at, at a particular node. So the number of sets uh, entered by E is the number of sets where that contain the endpoint of E, but don't contain its origination point. Um, and so, as an example, if I had a you know, if I had an edge, let me choose a different color. Uh, if I have an edge from this node to
to this node, it is an edge that's originating at a node that is not contained uh, in, in any of these subsets and is pointing towards, uh, towards one of those nodes. And therefore, this is an edge uh, that enters one, two, three different um, sets total in, uh, in, um, among all the sets that I've drawn. Now, um, what this claim is, is about is the number of sets of G odd entered by E. So we would have to figure out which of these three subsets that I've drawn that, it, that this edge enters uh, are odd and which are even, which, which is straightforward uh, to do, at least in this, um, in this example. Um, so the claim says that for any edge, the number of sets in G odd entered by E differs uh, from the number of sets in G even entered by E by at most one. For this example, it is uh, straightforward because it enters three um, subsets, and of those three subsets, you know, regardless of what other what other sets we we have uh, here, one of them is going to be odd or even, and the other two are going to be the other one. Right? So uh, in this case, of those three, it could differ at most one. So this is a parity argument. If we had made if there were uh, if there were yet another set like this, then it would, it would, that we would have two even and two odd. But again, the, it illustrates uh, what the claim is, um, what the claim is saying. Um, so this takes, I think the picture makes it uh, uh, pretty, pretty believable, uh, but it takes a little bit of reasoning just to make sure that we, that we're, we're, we're happy with it. And basically the proof of the claim follows because the rows correspond to R cuts, in other words, subsets that don't contain R. Um, and this is where we need laminarity. So, and critically, G is laminar. So, and my point that the, 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 the picture makes it easy to, to, to believe, but nevertheless, it's important to, con to convince yourself because if you you should write an you should make an example where you don't have a laminar family, you could conceivably still define uh, uh, extend this uh, this notion of height and maybe see that that this uh, that this claim uh, fails. So um, let, let me leave that for for an exercise for you. Um, <clears throat> of the proof of this claim. Okay, so, but once we have that, what does that, what does, what, what does this, uh, what does this tell us? It tells us, what is, a, what is it, why, why is it important how many, how many uh, of these subsets any particular edge enters? And the reason that that's important is that that's where there's a one in C. So, what we've got now is we have just drawing that picture again. This is C dash. And we have G. And I mentioned that we've got our, you know, our odd and even edges. I'm uh, sorry, our odd and even uh, subsets. And what we're saying now is, you know, we're, we're looking at here's that E that we were considering. It corresponds to this column. Let me fatten that up a little bit. Um, so this is this is the edge E, and the question is, where do we have um, 
where do we have ones in here? So we have ones wherever we're entering a set. And what this is saying is that you know, wherever this edge has ones, that uh, the number of um, ones that it has in all the odds differs by at most one from the number of ones it has in the evens. And therefore, if I partition this subset, let me call that CG further into CG odd and CG even, and I add all the rows in CG odd, that's just for any given column, I'm just counting the number of ones it has there, and that's gonna differ at most one by the number of ones it has in CG even. And this is exactly, uh, this, this shows that um, uh, C dash is totally unimodular. Again, by one of the equivalences that we had said would be particularly important, we use it also for bipartite, bipartite graphs um, uh, when we were talking about characterizations of, of totally unimodular. So in conclusion, this basically tells us that um, so C dash is totally unimodular. What does that mean? That means that max y transpose 1 subject to y transpose c dash um, less than or equal to l transpose y non-negative always has a integral optimal solution. And because we can extend this to be an optimal solution for the full problem, this tells us that max y transpose subject to y transpose c, not c dash, less than l transpose, has an integral optimal solution, which implies that, uh, which implies that our system is total unim is is total dual integral, and therefore by the Hoffman and Kruskal result that we gave several lectures back when we first started talking about total dual integrality and its uses, this tells us that um, um, I'm sorry it's 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 Hoffman and Kruskal which implies that this is a that uh, that this is uh, that this is total total dual integral, and then therefore this implies that the primal, which was our arborescence problem, has an has an integral solution for any L integral, and uh, that is our story. So that shows that the R arborescence problem, the LP relaxation, is uh, in fact exact.